I went to deepest, darkest Dagenham to see John Seaman and his exotic garden creation, which he's made in the back of his council house, no less. What I really loved about the garden was just how immersive it is. The plants are really high, they're like towering above your head, and it's got like frogs and toads and newts everywhere, and it just really kind of like tricks your senses so that you feel sort of like transported somewhere else entirely. I think this is an absolutely excellent example of what someone can do within their means when they've got a bit of a vision and they've got the passion so well done John, um, over to him. So we're here with John Seaman, we're in the Dagenham Exotic Garden uh, which is an absolutely gorgeous creation which John has basically made from scratch. Um, I will show you around the garden in little clips in a little bit but um, yeah it would be nice to speak with John and find out exactly how he arrived at what I can only describe as a triumph. So John do you want to just give a, a little outline of your garden and what, what it is? Uh, this garden is um, uh, themed on the foothills of the Himalayas. It has a montage of various beautiful plants from all around the world in different shapes, um, colours and forms to make a beautiful uh, tapestry of colour and pi a picture in every area. It's all divided down into um, garden rooms and so each garden room is ever so slightly different. When you had the garden as an empty canvas, did you start, did you plan the whole thing out first or did it just evolve organically? It was two things really. Firstly, uh, it did evolve, mm -hmm. uh, but also I realized that the, the idea of having um, seclusion and garden rooms was a good uh, idea. I have seating areas in each one. Um, and obviously it's a uh, part of the journey that you never see what's too far ahead because it makes the garden seem bigger and you blur the edges. So it, you look around the corner, what's going to be around the corner and you'll find something else. Yeah, true. And in fact, it mimics real life, like the natural environment that you're kind of um, going for. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, so um, I think what you, what you see was you look at the garden, you think, well, you know, in Dagenham, right, it's 51 <laughs> degrees north, what's happening? Uh, but yeah, it looks like something about 2000 miles away and uh, more stage set and things like that, but uh, rather than a, a, a council garden, which it is, <laughs> and I'm a council person. <laughs> well, good for you. <laughs> Thank you. So at what, at what stage did you feel happy enough with the garden that you decided to open it up to the public on the charity? Well, I, I had friends that previously opened their, their gardens. Um, I always used to jokingly call my garden the secret garden because uh, it was literally for my eyes only. And um, I thought the problem is I'm, I'm too insular, I need to be more extrovert. And uh, there's so many people that could learn and I think I needed to share what I've been my creation. And so that was um, when I started becoming more internet savvy and uh, onto the various platforms. And I found there's poor people like me. There Hooray! Really are. People Hooray. like me. <laughs> <laughs> that is the beauty of the internet. Yes. Connects people, like minded yeah, and people. I, I thought I was just a, one of a kind, like a chimera. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that the garden's based on the foothills of the Himalayas. Where did you get that idea from? What I thought was a lot of the plants actually come from that area. And the plants that live uh, in that out altitude are generally quite cold tolerant. And so it actually did lend itself to that. So we've got plants that um, grow inside that environment that are quite hardy in British uh, soil and uh, can winter out. And so I think it's, um, I think you need to see the garden and say, well, okay, it's unlike any other garden and you've got all this big foliage and it's blousy, um, it's very green. And it feels like being inside a, a forest glade or something like that and the sun dappled light coming through and it's like the foothills of the Himalayas and you think it's all the big leaves and everything else and you've got some prayer flags and you've got a Buddha and various sorts of other pieces that just um, stage set the entire garden. They do, yeah. I think it all hangs together really well from that idea. Like even if someone hasn't been to the Himalayas, you, you do basically feel like being transported somewhere else that's definitely outside of Britain. So what in your garden are you most proud of? The funny thing about the garden, I'm a bit crazy about things and I think myself, I'm actually quite impressed the, uh, the amount of uh, biodiversity has increased in this garden. Um, I've got lots of frogs, toads and newts and the, the, uh, I've got lots of uh, wood lice and loads of various types of insects and I'm, I'm very 
acutely aware that many of these species are actually declining, but not in this garden. Every garden should have a little pile of logs, poles of leaves, stop being too tidy, stop being too British, and make room for nature because it needs the help right now. It does, it does unfortunately. So do you feel surprised that you've managed to get a garden to such maturity in such a short space of time? Yeah, I am surprised it's uh, quite matured quite fast. Yeah. Um, I think it's, the garden area is, is in a microclimate. It actually is uh, cooler and uh, damper in here when it was right, uh, 40 degrees outside. And people notice that when they visit <laughs> the garden, it's That's actually so cool. in its own microclimate. Um, Obviously, all these large leaves, uh, they're perspiring, the water's coming into the atmosphere, so it's cooling it down. So it's its a real garden garden. It's And I, there's no bare soil because we don't do bare soil. It's just full of plants and it's vertical space everywhere. Just fill every space. Yeah, it's a real um, lesson also in how plants can be used to the wider good in terms of like, climate change and stuff like it makes me think of drainage gardens and stuff because it demonstrates that you can absolutely influence the conditions of a small area with the plants that you're, you're using. I think that's very much uh, true now. I think people are becoming more and more aware of that situation that um, a street without no trees is a sort of a X amount of degrees hotter and um, the cities need to have lungs as well and that means we need to plant some trees. We need to think about it now and what species we plant and we need to be uh, more uh, friendly to the environment, less chemicals um, and we've really got to start changing our ethos completely otherwise things are going to get a lot worse and if we haven't learned one thing this year then uh, we need to start thinking about it seriously. Do you have any plants that if you were to build a new garden for yourself or for someone else, are there any plants that are so completely useful that you would definitely use those plants? I'm a bit of a canon nut. I love canons. <laughs> um, there's so many different variants and there's, there's such a, a good doer. And a lot of the plants, the canons I leave out in the garden, I just mulch over. I put the sort of leaf and litter and everything over the top and so the frost can't get into them and um, the plants survive and do very well. These ones have all been wintered out for years and they're perfectly happy. So it just proves that if you look after something through the winter, and of course when it will the uh, leaflet I'll put on there and everything else breaks down, the bacteria breaks down, so you're recycling all the nutrients back into the soil. Anything brings rich in nitrogen. Did you ever get to a point where you felt like, oh, there's something that's kind of missing that I could include to, to give it, to kind of complete that feel that you're going for? There's things that, um, I included that I, I knew I needed to include, and there's things I deliberately left out. And but that's my, my personal choice, my ethos. I don't want to have a, a tree fern in, in the garden. Um, I'm happy uh, growing a bean tree, cattail or something like that, and uh, from a small one to a, a larger tree. Time's one of those things, and I'll control the arrow one. Uh, if I want to lift the canopy or have a lower canopy to suit that area. Yeah, and you grow quite a lot of stuff from seeds yourself, don't you? Yes, um, I grow lot, lots of plants from seeds, cuttings. Um, I'm doing it all the time, certainly in the autumn when uh, it starts getting cooler. Then I'll take lots of coleus cuttings and various forms of cuttings and I'll start preparing for the winter. But this garden will carry on until the first frost. Who did you learn from or who have you been influenced by? As I said, when I first uh, went to the careers office when I was 16, not very long ago, that I said I wanted, wanted to go into college to train on, uh, for horticulture. And they, they gave me a factory job, basically, and as a, obviously a type class deck and that sort of stuff. But I, I would say that fire that was inside me never turned off and it carried on. And I'll say to anybody else, don't be denied or whatever black backgrounds or whatever. If you've got that in you, just carry on. Your your passion might be slightly different. Everyone's garden will be slightly different. It's your personality. That's what literally what it is. So I think you can be as garish as you want or colour clash as you want. Your personal choice, your expression of your 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 art almost. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely think that's a, a very important thing. Would you essentially say you're self-taught? Yes, I was influenced by uh, Will Giles. Oh yeah. Um, I, I visit his garden a fair few times and I picked his brain silly all the time about various plants and he was very forthcoming with lots of information. I'm try and do that for other people now. And uh, there's a wealth of uh, information. Without his input, I don't think this garden would be quite like this. 
Um, and also, I was quite influenced by the um, the old rose garden at Great Dixter, mm-hmm. uh, the creation of uh, Christopher Lloyd and uh, Fergus Garrett. And oh, yeah. uh, I found that every year that's slightly different. Um, when I went visiting last time round, I walked around and I realised I was smiling all the way through the uh, their garden. And the reason why, because I got it, because the way they designed it now, and you have to stoop and go like this around the plants, it was like a Narnia feeling. I was like, I felt like a kid, Narnia. It was an amazing feeling. And that's what I think people should really create, really aim for something in your garden, your own creation, your own rooms, your own space, your, literally your own personality. What kind of principles have you personally built this garden on? Well, firstly, uh, the use of colour. I, lo- I do love to use bold colours. Um, I'll use punctuation like orange, another punctuate or purple, but I also offset it against another. But at the end of the day, predominantly this garden is by far a green garden and the multitudes of colours of green are as, uh, as various as any other colour. But And colours only as good as what you put against it as well. Do you get to out to other gardens yourself quite a lot? But sometimes I go and see some gardens. Uh-huh. Um, I get invited to people's gardens who, who come and visit. Yeah, they're all different t- sorts of gardens. It might be a garden with 12 gnomes in or something like that. But uh, hey, everyone's got a different garden and it's always their personality and quirkiness. And I say, please express yourself in your garden. Don't worry about the colours or trying to please other people's eyes. Please just please your own eyes. It's, you know, it's all colour, shape and form. It's an art in itself. Who do you actually look to if in exotic gardening? Well, it's definitely Will Giles. I've still got his books and I still use them okay. as reference. They're very informative, very interesting, very pricey as well. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, you know what I mean? I always need to know the hardiness of something. Some species type are different from the hybrid types. And it's the new nitty gritty you need to know because something will be hardier than uh, another one or you know, what light levels it needs. And um, this garden, you can see that it's, uh, a lot of it is actually in quite a lot of shade. The plants are actually loving it because it's uh, the microclimate in here. It's, uh, it's about the temperature and the moisture rather than the exposure to the sun. A lot of plants are stressed by sun. And certainly this year when it hit 40 degrees, it was quite temperate here still. And everyone who visited just loved it. It's one of those gardens you either, I think you, you really need to get it. I think not, uh, most people just seem to get it. Yeah, I, I think so too, because it's it's a complete sense of immersion. Like you very, very, very rarely get in a domestic garden. Mm. Like I think you've managed to achieve, well, I think it's amazing really. The little pockets of planting, and the, there's a coherent kind of theme that goes through the whole thing. Cause it's, you know, it's obviously very kind of like jungly and tropically. But it, it is a joy to walk around the corner and it is a joy to find another room and another pond. And yeah, there's so many different parts of it. Um, I know I was here last weekend with my kids and they loved it mm. as well. And yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely beautiful. Well, that's what I like to say. I say I like to uh, introduce people and I tell them roughly the ethos of the garden, because obviously all this uh, leaf matter and everything stays within the garden. So nothing goes out of the garden. I, everything gets reused. We only use organic fertilizers and uh, there's no pest, uh, the only pest control I have here is the frogs, toads and newts and they do a marvellous job 24 seven. And I think everyone should have a pond because it's the heart of the garden as much as the greenhouse is the engine. Uh, certainly people should consider that. And the amount of uh, wildlife that you're achieving in your garden, if you add a pond, make sure it's nicely sloped so you don't drown hedgehogs and things like that it will be a benefit and you'll enjoy it. All right, good. Well, let's go and we'll take a look around and see what we can see. Thanks very much, John. Yeah, I'm on my game all day, the same all day. Took me a long time, but never quit it, no way. And I high nothing, I ain't doing two pays. On my beat flying kicks, kind of like I'm no way. Creating a fiasco, kind of like I'm hooray. Did a party like an 18, kind of like 